If you're designing an API endpoint to generate a transcript for a specific video, a video by ID, how would you do it? And that's the question posed by James Quick on Twitter, where he gave the options of one, post request that has the ID property in the body, a get request that has the ID in a query parameter. Now, I'm not sure if the question and solutions were engagement bait. If they were, it's working, because what I wanna do is expand on that question and those two options, because I really don't think they fit in a common scenario. But before we get to my solutions, let me know in the comments how you would design this API. In that common scenario, is not everything's a quick response. So the idea is that you're gonna make a request to generate a transcript, and that's the end of it. And it's just a fast request response. The reality of it is, that's where I'm taking this and expanding on this, is generating a transcript likely isn't something that's gonna be very quick. It could be long running. So a process that's long running or workflow behind the scenes that's long running is that something's gonna take a long time. Do we really wanna have the client make that HTTP request and just wait for the generating of that transcript? Likely not. Before I talk about some solutions, I wanna thank Event Store for sponsoring this video. Event Store DB is a new category of operational database built for event sourcing, CQRS, and event driven microservices. For more on Event Store DB, check out the link in the description. So the two options given of a post request with the ID of the video in the body or a get request with the ID in the URI and a query string, that's not really what I'm concerned about. More the root of the problem what I really wanna see or think about is how do I handle a request that's gonna take a long time? We're gonna have a long running request. One solution is to perform that work asynchronously so that when our client makes the request to our HTTP API, we're not generating that transcript or doing that work immediately. Rather, we're just gonna place a message on a queue. Then we can return back to our client very quickly. Separately, we could have a separate process or thread pick up that message from our queue, then perform the work of generating the transcript. But there's a problem that we introduced, which is before, if we were generating the request immediately, we could return the request a part of the response. But since now we're generating it asynchronously, how do we notify and communicate back with the client when it's completed? One solution to this is having a resource that provides the status of that initial request. So here's kind of the workflow of what it looks like. We have our client make that HTTP request to our to generate the transcript. That's a post request, for example. The response of that is gonna be a 202 accepted. In that, there's gonna be a header that's gonna have location to a status resource, some URI that we can then make a get request to. And its response there might be a 200 okay. There's some different debates on this, if this is gonna be a 200 or a 404. But in either case, what it's gonna indicate is that the resource isn't, that new resource that you're creating, the transcript, isn't available yet. So you then may pull that request after some retry that also can be provided in the header to say, okay, I'm still looking for it. Maybe if it does exist at that point, in asynchronously, we've generated that transcript. Now we can return a 302 found with a location header to the new resource. So that way our client now knows where the new resource is, what that URI is, we're providing it to the client. It can make that request, that get request, and then we can pro provide it back, the transcript with a 200 okay. Now this is actually a really common pattern, but you might be thinking, wow, that's incredibly gross. Like we're doing polling, really? This is 2024, we're doing polling? Yes, you actually are doing polling, but you gotta think about it, not all context is given in the browser. You may have situations where you have an HTTP client that's not living in a browser. This may be more like server to server integrations, and this is one way of handling that, but there are more. So if you have the means to push data to client, or you have two-way communication, or you have some type of persistent connection, well, those are also options. So as the example, let's say that you had a WebSockets connection, you can make that connection with your HTTP API. You can then still even use separately your just existing request like we were doing before that kicks off the work to our broker. From there, that initial request is done, but we still maintain that WebSockets connection that's persistent. Once our work actually happens from there, and depending on the technology you're using, we can then push that information back with that WebSockets connection to tell it, okay, this job is done. Here's some information. Here's the transcript itself, or just even providing with the URI so it can make a subsequent GET request to that new resource. But a really important aspect of this that I'm trying to convey is that when a user just clicks a button that makes an HTTP request to a server, there's oftentimes a lot of things that need to happen. And it may not be quick. It may be one action, but that one action may spur a lot of actions and turn into some really long running business process behind the scenes. All of this is very applicable where you wanna give back notifications or feedback to the client about something that's occurred. Here's a really simple example of this. I'm gonna have a link to this video that has all the code that illustrate this at the end of this video. 
But what it does is I have on the left window, just a customer facing way of ordering pizzas. And on the right, it's kind of the admin side where you can see all the orders and go through the different status changes through them. So I'm just gonna actually order a pizza here really quick. Just enter some fake data. And here's our order. We can see that it's placed. I have two different windows. They're using WebSockets though, so that as things happen, we can push those changes and communicate via WebSockets to the client. So if I see, I can do start preparing. It immediately changed in the, set, the other window. That's our customer facing one, out for delivery and delivered. And that example is exactly the same thing as that original question that posed this whole thing of generating a transcript, is that there's some long running action. It could be a single action. It could be the same thing as delivering a pizza where it's this long running business process. It's all the same thing is that things are done asynchronously and in that comes the challenge of communicating back with the client. And everybody can relate to this. Let's say you're placing an order on an e-commerce website, you enter your credit card, you hit submit, not immediately is it going to save the record to a database, charge your credit card, and then send out an email confirmation. Likely in most big websites, those are all done asynchronously. And what happens if your credit card fails for whatever reason? You enter the wrong number, wrong expiry, whatever the case may be. What happens? It doesn't expect that we have some technical solution where you're just sitting in your browser and there needs to be a WebSockets connection. No, not at all. You're gonna get an email telling you your credit card failed and ways to, to remedy that back on the website by updating it. But an email is a form of communication. Asynchronous work is all over the place. So hopefully this just give you an idea of different ways of handling it. I'll have a link to another video at the end of this video that kind of illustrates the asynchronous world around us. If you enjoyed videos like this and you wanna chat with other software developers, you have questions or you wanna provide answers, you can join my channel and get access to a private Discord server. Check the link in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.